Patron aims to deliver a more thoughtful, comfort oriented take on the mid-sized SUV market with this stylish C5 Aircross model. If you're after a five-seat contender in this sector that'll look after you a little more, offer up some stylish talking points and give you some clever technology, this one could be worth a look. What if the kind of ride comfort that you get on a large luxury SUV could be replicated or even improved on in an affordable mid-sized model? Well, that's what this car, Citroen C5 Aircross, sets out to provide to Qashqai class folk. Citroen may have arrived late to this particular party, but at least it's trying to bring it something new. The legendary Citroen 2CV had a reputation for being able to comfortably traverse a ploughed field. That apart though, this French brand can't call on much customer recognition when it comes to vehicles capable of functioning off the beaten track. A decade or so back, there were two rebadged Mitsubishi models, uh, the C-Crosser and a car we didn't get, the C4 Aircross, but that's been about it from Citroen when it comes to mid-sized contenders of this kind. Uh, this has to change, of course, given the current European obsession with SUVs and the company is depending on its Aircross range of models to convince customers of its crossover credibility. Now the first signs in this regard have been promising for the Gallic maker. The little C3 Aircross launched in summer 2017 has sold well in the small super mini derived SUV sector. This family hatch based C5 Aircross will be equally important in the class above and it claims to bring an all new level of overall comfort to the segment. Now that comes courtesy of super supportive advanced comfort seats and the clever new suspension system using what the mark calls progressive high hydraulic cushions. The C5 Aircross might sell itself to you in terms of its practicality too. There's best-in-class boot space and the versatile back seat package that gives you three individual sliding, folding and reclining rear chairs. Now talking of chairs, although this car is a fraction bigger than the Peugeot 3008 and Vauxhall Grandland X SUV models that it shares its PSA Group engineering with, it's not large enough to offer a seven seat option. Still, if that's not an issue and you're buying in this segment, there's plenty else to catch your attention. Options include a grip control, off-road traction setup, and there are six connectivity technologies, 19 driver assistance systems, and 30 exterior color combinations. Plus, there's something that we haven't seen before in this sector, a connected cam dash cam camera. It's all created a five-seat family SUV that promises to be genuinely different, and we're gonna try it. In a C5 Aircross, according to Citroen, you'll be traveling premier class. So what exactly does that mean? Something significant, surely, given that this car's main selling point is a unique progressive hydraulic cushion suspension system. Now, the name of the car might suggest this to be an air sprung setup. Uh, the current trend might suggest it to be driver adaptive. Neither solution, though, fits with the approach that Citroen has to take at this price point. Uh, the company lost money building too much damping complexity into its affordable cars in the 60s and 70s and it's not about to make the same mistake again. So what we've got here instead is an ordinary everyday spring and damper setup that's been reimagined in a rather clever way. In ordinary cars, uh, such a system usually works with rubber bump stops that the suspension coil crashes against over bumps at the top and bottom of wheel travel. The progressive hydraulic cushion setup uh, replaces those stops with hydraulic dampers. Now these cushion those impacts over things like speed humps and tarmac tears and allow the fitment of softer springs and dampers producing the exemplary ride quality that Citroen claims this car can deliver. Uh, it seems to work too too. Now we wouldn't join the French brand in describing it as magic carpet like, uh, you'd need proper air suspension for that, but overall this is the best conventional springing setup that we've tried. It eases the car over poor surfaces and it floats you from crest to crest in a way that makes the ride of some class competitors feel rather crude. Um, thick, quilted, advanced comfort front seats further embellish the feeling of Gallic luxury. 
If Citroen could affordably combine all this with the forward scanning camera technology that parent group PSA stumped up for for this model's DS7 Crossback SUV cousin, a setup that uh, predicts and prepares for bumps before you reach them, then you'd think that something really special might be possible. For the time being though, uh, we're going to be left with a damping solution that works well but is affected more than you'd hope by things like deeper potholes or the unwise fitment of over large 19 inch wheel rims. Perhaps though that is the price you pay for getting a big improvement in ride comfort without the corresponding payback of an SUV that handles like a waterbed through the bends. Now this Citroen doesn't do that, but predictably it does roll more than its rivals if you push on through the turns with any kind of real vigour. Uh, if you can ignore this, then there's actually more grip and traction than you'd think, although the somewhat over-light electric steering does its best to disguise that fact. Um, it's better though to just throttle back and drive with more Gallic decorum. Enthusiasts won't be buying this car anyway. Only folk who want a lower pulse rate, not a faster one. For these people, the E88 8-speed ASIN developed automatic gearbox that will be uh, typically specified with this car will be perfect, efficiently slurring its way between the ratios in a manner that really suits this C5's relaxed gait. The engine that we've chosen to test is the base 1.2 litre three cylinder PureTech petrol unit. This offers 130 horsepower, more than you get with the base petrol engine found in some rivals, and it seems on paper to offer a reasonable set of performance stats. Rest to 62 in 10.7 seconds on the way to 117 miles an hour. On the road though, the efforts of that little triple cylinder power plant are somewhat hobbled by the fact that the curb weight of this SUV is likely to be up around 1.5 tons once you've fitted a few extras. A Citroen's are not too dissimilarly sized C4 Cactus hatch model is the best part of half a ton lighter fitted with the same engine. Such is the penalty for fashionable crossover credibility. If you're going to overcome that, you'd probably be better off selecting a diesel and probably the most affordable 1.5 litre Blue HDI 130 variant. Uh, this almost precisely duplicates the acceleration from rest and top speed stats of the equivalent 130 petrol unit, but it feels very different in the mid-range thanks to a 300 newton metre torque figure, which is 30% greater than the base PureTech petrol unit can manage. This in turn means less of a need to row manual versions of this car along with the gear lever in city motoring and that's something that you'll be uh, thankful for in a C5 Aircross equipped with a stick shift because the gear lever is positioned rather high and that makes constant ratio changes in town a touch more awkward than they'd normally be. It is better though to pay the extra for the auto box, uh, an option on the base diesel but mandatory on the two more powerful engines that lie at the top of the C5 Aircross range. Both get 180 badges and a largely irrelevant sport button on the centre console that ramps up engine noise, but not a lot else. Uh, engine noise, that's not really something you want to hear more of in a diesel, especially not uh, from Citroen's 2-litre Blue HDI 180 power plant, which is one of the brand's older engines. It's quite a lusty lump, though. It develops uh, 400 newton metres, which is why this variant can uh, offer easily the highest brake towing capacity in the range, uh, 1,650 kilos and it gets from rest to 62 in 8.6 seconds. That's over three seconds quicker than the Blue HDI 130 auto model can manage. Uh, the top speed is 131 miles an hour. If you're looking for extra performance from your C5 Aircross and you're following the current zeitgeist by dumping diesel, then your alternative is a petrol engine not previously seen in a Citroen, a 1.6 litre PureTech 180 four-cylinder power plant. Now this certainly gives the car a touch more urgency. Uh, the rest of 62 miles an hour sprint time is 8.2 seconds on the way to 134 miles an hour. That 1.6 litre PureTech unit also features as part of the plug-in hybrid technology that Citroen has developed for this car, and that pairs that engine with a 110 HP electric motor powered by a 300 volt lithium-ion battery pack, and that can be recharged in less than two hours from a 6.6 kilowatt 32 amp wall box. Once it has been, a C5 Aircross in that form can travel for around 30 miles without using any fuel at all. 
As for the off-road promise suggested by the SUV Starling, well, it isn't completely without foundation, despite the fact that mainstream models can't be ordered with any kind of 4x4 system. Citroen thinks that customers in this class don't need the weight and complexity of all-wheel traction, so instead uh, the French brand offers C5 buyers the extra-cost option of a grip control setup that works through the stability system to better manage front-wheel traction in slippery conditions, and that's aided by a hill assist descent control system to ease you down sharper slopes and the option of special mud and snow tyres. The grip control package copies Land Rover's terrain response setup in offering the driver the chance to choose different settings to suit different surfaces. Uh, there are five separate modes on offer, normal, snow, mud, sand and ESP off. And now none of this is able to make this car into any kind of mud plugger, but in combination with a useful 230 millimeters of ground clearance, it's all enough to potentially make light forest tracks easily passable. And of course, equipped with grip control, this Citroen would be a good deal more capable in a snowy snap than most of its competitors. Apparently, this car would be slightly more capable in the desert than its rivals too. The progressive hydraulic cushion package having originally been developed there to help Citroen's Paris-Dakar rally cars better absorb the impacts of sand dune strewn tracks. Uh, Aircross owners though will want to leave the wilderness stuff to bare grills and instead enjoy the things that this car does rather better. Cruising comfortably at higher speeds is definitely one of them and that's thanks to impressive standards of refinement aided by the standard acoustic windscreen. If that's the kind of mileage that your C5 will regularly engage in and you can afford to buy in at the top of the range, you'll be able to make use of a highway driver assist system, which is Citroen's best current attempt at so-called level two driving autonomy. Now this setup uh, automatically regulates your speed, uh, your position on the road, and also your distance to the vehicle in front. Although you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times and you have to keep your wits about you too, because the car will quickly revert full control back to you when road markings become less than clear. So where does all that leave us? With a premier class mid-sized SUV as promised? Well, if you prioritize the thing that this Citroen does best, uh, you may well think so. And even if you don't, you'll still appreciate the fact that this car has tried to provide something dynamically different, as a Citroen always should. Citroen's had to think carefully about the design positioning of this car to avoid uh, trespassing on the territory of the four other PSA Group mid-sized SUVs which already campaign in various parts of this one's chosen segment. This C5 Aircross is a five-seat design but it's quite a large one with a 4.5 meter length that makes it a fraction bigger than the Gallic conglomerate's two other five-seat contenders in this sector, the Peugeot 3008 and the Vauxhall Grand Linex, but a fraction smaller smaller than PSA's seven-seat offerings in the class, Peugeot's 5008 and the DS7 Crossback. Of course, if this Citroen is to find its own band of buyers, the differentiation has to lie in more than just size, so this SUV adopts some of the striking aesthetic cues that have helped its C3 Aircross uh, showroom stablemate gather quite a large following in the crossover class below. Uh, familiar touches include this raised muscular bonnet and the usual Citroen two-tier lighting signature, with these top units here uh, housing the LED daytime running lights. Uh, the lower ones are used for the headlights lamps. Now, a little disappointingly, given current trends, these can't be ordered with full LED illumination. Still, forget technology and concentrate instead on character, as Citroen hopes you'll be minded to by specifying uh, these lower corner intakes in either red, silver, or as in this case, white, narrow-footed corner bumper vents uh, at a finishing touch. Move to the side and the floating roof effect that Citroen stylists have striven for is very evident. That's thanks to the way that the car's glazed area wraps 360 degrees around the vehicle with gloss black A and B pillars, black quarter lights and surfacing interrupted only by the chromed C signature which wraps around the rear side window and aims to emphasise this design's spacious interior. A black contrast coloured roof is offered as an option but these curiously shaped roof bars are standard 
standard and they can, like these lower air bump panels, share the same optional colour coding that we mentioned earlier. The wheels can be 17, 18 or 19 inches in size. We've got the 18 inch swirl style rims here. Uh, there's not quite so much pavement theatre at the back end, but these revised rear lights each feature four 3D LED modules, which create a distinctively high-tech nighttime illuminated signature. Uh, vents in the spoiler aim to emphasise the smooth aerodynamics. And you get them too in the bumper, which on plusher models features this uh, chrome effect exhaust and either gloss black or is here matte black trim. Um, all this dressing is there, of course, to hide the fact that there's really nothing very different about the engineering here which sees this car riding on the same light strong EMP2 platform used in various ways by the four other PSA group mid-sized SUVs mentioned earlier. Time to take a seat inside. Now, given the need to base the whole cabin on PSA hardware, uh, Citroen's designers have done pretty well to give it such an air of individuality. Now, we'll get to the digital dash and all the stitched frippery in a moment, but what we really need to draw your attention to first are the generously proportioned advanced comfort seats, which come as standard, providing you avoid entry-level trim. Now they feature particularly broad bases, foam which is 15 millimeters thicker than usual for extra support, plus extra quilted padding to create an inviting visual signature that doesn't disappoint once you squish yourself into them. Uh, there's standard lumbar support here too. Uh, the headrests, they do look like a bit of an afterthought though, and there's not much side support, but otherwise these pews brilliantly replicate the kind of feeling of cosseting Gallic luxury that affordable Citroens of the 60s and 70s used to offer. Colour-coordinated strips across the seat base edge and the shoulder line add a smart finishing touch. In comparison, uh, the front chairs that you get in rivals are dull and unyielding. Here, you really notice the difference. Seats aside, as with most modern Citroens, what you get here is a mixture of interesting design, voluptuous curves, little stitched design details, faux leather trimming, fascia colour changes and so on, and some rather cheap plastic finishes reminding you that you haven't stumped up for a premium brand model in this segment. Now you would expect those further down the dash on an affordable mid-sized SUV, but it's not particularly nice to be faced with shiny, scratchy finishes in more obvious areas like the fascia top and the glove box lid. Uh, fortunately though, your attention is diverted away from cost-cutting compromises by the kind of lovely design detailing that you, uh, well, you really probably wouldn't think you'd find at this price point. Uh, this stitched strap on the passenger side fascia panel and this lovely faux leather cowl on top of the instrument binnacle, for instance. Um, the little touches of chrome and lacquered black trim are nice and even the stitched door cards with their air bump style indentation finishing look stylish and distinctive. Uh, now we mentioned the instrument binnacle, that's another cabin talking point. Conventional dials have been completely replaced by this fully configurable and customizable standard 12.3 inch color screen, as is the norm now with larger PSA group cars. Five different display modes, minimum, dials, driving, uh, navigation and personal are all accessed via a roller switch on the left hand side of the steering wheel here, which prompts intricately animated changes from state of the art animation that uh, according to your preference can be configured to display in red, blue or brown. Visual priority can be given to speed readouts, to navigation mapping or driving safety features, or you can choose to view only the absolute minimum of information if all that gives you a bit of a headache. Um, it is a bit annoying though that dials doesn't actually give you any dials. Uh, it just gives you a curious rev counter band, a temperature readout and a central digital speedo that you don't really need because with all the modes, you get a strangely configured horizontal speedometer at the top of the display. That's modeled on the rotating drum style readouts that classic Citroens used to use in the 70s. Uh, whatever setting you've opted for, a button press at the end of the right hand steering column stalk also delivers trip computer information onto the left hand side of the screen. 
Just about everything else you'll need to know can be found on this 8-inch centre dash capacitive touchscreen, which in a refreshing break from modern automotive interior design hasn't been inserted in such a way that it looks like an iPad hammered to the top of the fascia. Uh, now, it's not the best setup of its kind we've seen. Um, VW grip models, for example, feature sharper graphics and less lag between feature selection, but it does deliver everything you'd want. Uh, the usual DAB stereo, phone, navigational and informational functions, plus Wi-Fi and a connected apps package. It also has a mirror screen feature that via the mirror link or Apple CarPlay systems allows smartphone mirroring. Uh, we were less pleased to find that this screen is also burdened with the ventilation controls. Now in our view, key things like that are much better separated out. Uh, there are some menu shortcut buttons just below the screen that help things in this regard, but they're of the uh, touch sensitive rather than the physical sort, so they're difficult to use on the move without taking your eyes off the road. Um, if, as would be quite natural, you use the ridge uh, just below the monitor here where they sit as a place to steady your hand between selecting screen icons, uh, you'll quite often find yourself um, operating the capacitive buttons by mistake. Cabin storage offers another Citroen-esque mixture of beautifully crafted design and frustrating finishing. And we really like this intricately stitched twin-lidded storage box between the seats, which incorporates a lift-out oddments tray and has illumination, which you'll need because the deeper part extends right forward below these twin cup holders, which in nice touch are also illuminated. But why aren't there any connectivity ports in this storage area that would allow you to charge your phone away from prying eyes? Why, as usual on PSO Group cars, is the glove box capacity massively compromised by the vehicle's fuse box? Why is there no overhead compartment for your sunglasses? And why do these deep door pockets not include bottle holders? You'd really think that these would be relatively easy things to fix. On the plus side though, uh, there is a big open cubby in front of the gear lever with a 12 volt socket and a USB port. Uh, there's an open stowage area by the driver's right knee and there are ticket clips on the uh, sun visors here. There aren't really any other issues unless you object to the rather high placement of the gear stick, uh, which isn't a problem on the auto models, but isn't ideal on a manual variant like this one. Uh, aside from that, the driving position is great, not only because of these squashy seats, but also because you're afforded the kind of reasonably commanding view out that it's now not possible to take for granted on a fashion-led SUV these days. Uh, All-round visibility is good, uh, but just in case, rear parking sensors are standard across the range and if you avoid entry-level trim you'll also get a rear view camera. From mid-spec upwards your car will come complete with two things that we'd want. Uh, the first is what Citroen calls its Metropolitan Grey Ambiance Trimming Pack which includes grey console and dashboard inserts and mixes graphite coloured cloth and grained leather upholstery uh, to pleasing effect. Uh, the second key feature is something new to the segment, a connected cam dash cam camera that sits behind this rear view mirror which allows owners not only to record ongoing journey footage in case of accidents but also to share road trip photos and videos directly with friends and family. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now if you're lifting things like child seats in and out uh, you'll be glad of this model's high roof height and its wide opening doors. Once inside, you'll find a much bigger cabin than you'll get in cheaper segment contenders like Nissan's Qashqai and Seat Attica, and you'll get what Citroen claims is the most modular rear bench arrangement in the class. Uh, it's certainly very versatile. It's made up of three individual sliding, folding and reclining seats. Now, each of them uh, can recline um, in five positions from 19 through 26.5 degrees, and they can slide back and forth over a range of 150 mils to improve either rear luggage room or a leg room here. Not that you really need to improve leg room, that generous 4.5 meter body length means there's plenty of that. What you actually might require though is a touch more headroom, at least in a car like this one that's fitted out with Citroen's huge panoramic glass top. The roof itself is nice to have. It measures an impressive 1120 mils by 840 mils and it floods the cabin with light. But the ceiling height reduction it brings with it does mean that taller folk will find themselves brushing the headlining. 
still, you don't have to have this feature unless you've bought in right at the top of the range. And of more importance is the fact that uh, this is one of the only models in the segment in which the middle seat occupant won't feel as if they've drawn the short straw on longer trips. Now, that's partly because of this uh, particularly low centre transmission tunnel, but it's mainly because these three individual seats are of equal width as they would be in an MPV. Now, that means you don't get a centre armrest, of course, which annoyingly also means that you can't have any cup holders back here. Uh, but in compensation, there are um, seat back pockets, uh, there's decently sized door bins, there are twin central vents, uh, overhead lights, and a central USB port, all provided for your travelling comfort. And out back, uh, well, now on our way to the boot, let's once again reference the fact that Citroen hasn't felt it necessary to offer a seven-seat option in this sector, even though it's only fractionally shorter than other class contenders who do. But at least that means you should be able to expect a generously sized boot. Let's see. Uh, now, the tailgate is easy to lift up. Uh, so you don't really need the electric operation we've got here. That's something only supplied as standard right at the top of the range and it's complete with functionality that can be activated with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you find yourself approaching the car laden down with bags. Uh, once the hatch is raised, you're faced with a large 580 litre boot. Now that is a fraction less than this car's Peugeot 3008 cousin can offer, but that car, like most SUVs in the class, can't be specified with a rear bench that you can slide forward to improve things. Do that in a C5 Aircross and if you don't mind giving your rear seat occupants city car standards of legroom, uh, your luggage capacity is going to rise to 720 litres. Now to give you some sort of class perspective, a Nissan Qashqai gives you a maximum of only 430 litres of space and a Ford Cougar only 406 litres. So no, all mid-sized SUVs aren't the same. Uh, getting to the stowage area means negotiating this rather high loading lip, but a standard adjustable height boot floor has been designed in, and it's not compromised in its functionality by the sighting of the standard spare wheel, as is the case with a 3008. Uh, for effective use of this space, uh, there are tie-down points to which you can attach an optional luggage net, plus there's a 12-volt socket and removable side panels that make it easy to transport wider items. Bag hooks have been forgotten about, though, as have seat retraction sidewall catches. Now, the latter wouldn't be too much of an issue if you could, as usual, reach forward and release the rear bench through the normal seat shoulder catches. But, annoyingly, they're missing too. Which means that to push down the seat backs, you have the faff of walking around to the side of the car and pulling on the little straps provided on each individual seat. On the plus side, the three-way equal split means that you can, if necessary, just push forward the central chair, allowing you to easily transport longer items like skis without disturbing a couple of rear-seated passengers. Now, talking of long items, another thing Citroen hasn't thought to provide is the fold-flat front passenger seat option that you'd get in the 3008. The brand thinks that with up to 1.9 metres of cargo length on offer, you shouldn't need that. Well, perhaps. The total capacity figure certainly shouldn't disappoint. Uh, up to 1,630 litres of space being on offer from the flat seats retracted cargo area. So let's get to the pricing, which from launch was pitched in the £23,500 to £33,000 bracket. And that's pretty much what you'd expect these days for a family-sized Qashqai class, mid-sized SUV with cutting-edge design and a front-driven only model lineup. As for trimming choices, where there's no really Spartan spec level, so bear that in mind when you're price matching against apparently much cheaper segment alternatives, and there's no irrelevantly sporty top model either. Instead, C5 Aircross buyers are offered three pretty middle-of-the-road trim choices. Feel, this mid-range flare spec, or top flare plus. 
The most affordable 130 badged variants come with a choice of two engines. Uh, Citroen's uh, impressively efficient three-cylinder 1.2-litre PureTech 130 turbo petrol unit. We've been trying that here and it might be all you really need if your annual mileage is quite low. Most customers though are likely to want to pay extra for one of the 1.5-litre Blue HDI 130 diesel variants. Uh, the premium to go from 1.2-litre petrol power to the base diesel is £1,500. And if you do prefer a 1.5 litre Blue HDI version, you'll be offered the option of finding £1,600 more to get the brand's E88 eight-speed auto gearbox. Avoid entry-level trim and the range widens to include larger capacity petrol and diesel units, both with 180 badges and both offered only with E88 auto transmission. And now there's quite a big increase in price to get them though. The 2-litre Blue HDI 180 unit is a £1,900 step up from an equivalent Blue HDI 130 auto. Uh, the 1.6-litre PureTech 180 petrol unit is £3,000 more than an equivalent 1.2-litre PureTech variant, though of course much of that gap is explained by the larger petrol power plant switch from manual to auto transmission. That engine also forms the basis for the alternative petrol electric plug-in hybrid variant that you can ask your dealer about. From a Citroen range perspective, C5 Aircross pricing represents the premium of around £5,500 over the next SUV down in the company's range, the C3 Aircross. Uh, there'd be a price jump of around £4,000 if you were graduating to this car from an equivalent version of the brand's more ordinary C4 Cactus hatch. But the difference would only be around £800 to £1,000 if you were choosing this C5 SUV over an equivalent version of the company's C4 Space Tourer MPV People Carrier. On to the value proposition that Citroen's pricing represents in the mid-sized SUV market. Uh, now, in assessing that, we should probably start with this model's two closest sister designs, Peugeot's 3008 and Vauxhall's Grandland X, since under the skin, all three cars are pretty much the same. Uh, comparing prices between these three contenders is difficult, though, because the spec levels are differently orientated. But it is difficult to escape the conclusion that this Citroen model is significantly better to value, not only because it's slightly bigger, but also because it incorporates as standard the useful sliding and reclining free individual seat arrangement that you can't have on those two other cars. Uh, for reference, base spec to base spec with the volume 130 badged petrol and diesel models, uh, a Grandland X will typically cost you three to five hundred pounds less than this C5. A 3008 will typically cost you around £700 more for a petrol variant and about £1,800 more for a diesel. It's probable, though, that the cars in this class that you're more likely to be considering as an alternative will be the ones that most of the magazines will point you towards in the family-orientated mid-sized SUV segment, Nissan's Qashqai and Seat's Attica. Now, both handle a little more sharply than this Citroen, and on the face of things, they look as though they'd save you quite a lot of money, about £3,500 in the case of the Nissan, and slightly more than that in the case of the Seat. But, as I referenced earlier, you'd need to avoid base trimmed variants with a Qashqai or an Attica to get a true comparison to this Citroen's entry-level feel spec which would more than halve the deficit and you'd still then end up with a car offering quite a lot less space for your rear passengers and for your luggage. Uh, to a lesser extent the same comments are also true of the rival Kia Sportage and that could save you up to around £3,000 in base form but it cost significantly more to run. So what else is there in the main part of the five-seat mid-sized SUV volume brand segment? Well, nothing else that rides like this Citroen, to be sure. Think in terms of saving around £2,000 if you were going to go for a Renault Kajar or a Skoda Karok. Both are efficient to run, but they're much less versatile than this Citroen. Two much less efficient class contenders, which are also a good deal less practical than this Aircross, are Mitsubishi's Eclipse Cross, that would save you around £2,000, and Hyundai's Tucson, which would save you around £700 to £1,000 over this C5. A base spec Volkswagen Tiguan, that's only fractionally cheaper than this Citroen, but it'd be significantly more expensive when it was trimmed to a similar standard. Uh, the Mini Countryman and the Ford Cougar, they cost about the same as the C5, uh, but again, they're much smaller inside, and the Ford is pricey to run by class standards. 
A Mazda CX-5, which also has a smaller cabin, would cost you fractionally more than an Aircross. Uh, most versions of the Jeep Compass, they'd cost around £1,500 to £2,000 more, and the Honda CR-V would cost around £2,500 more. Lots of options then in the mid-sized SUV class. Now, if we haven't mentioned the one that you've been thinking of as an alternative, there are various reasons why. It may be that the mid-sized crossover contender you have in mind is based on a stretched version of a smaller super mini platform. So, of course, it will probably be significantly cheaper, but quite cramped inside, like a Honda HRV, a Suzuki SX4 S-Cross, an Audi Q2, a Volkswagen T-Roc or a Mitsubishi ASX. Or we may have omitted the mid-sized SUV you have in mind because it has a premium badge, so it won't be directly comparable because it's significantly more expensive, like a Mercedes GLA, a Volvo XC40, an Audi Q3, a Jaguar E-Pace, or a BMW X1. Perhaps the mid-sized SUV in question might be more expensive because it non-negotiably comes with hybrid power, like a Lexus UX or a Toyota RAV4, or because it has to be had with four-wheel drive, like Subaru's XV. Uh, now, we also haven't yet mentioned the fact that you can also save quite a lot in this segment by going for a bargain brand contender like Sangyong's Corando or Tivoli XLV models, or perhaps the MGGS, but there you really will get what you haven't paid for. What's not up for discussion is that there are a bewildering number of options in this segment, but we can see plenty of people deciding this Citroen is uh, one of the most appealing of them. Now, if that is your perspective, then you're going to need to know just how generous this brand has been when it comes to the standard equipment. So let's take a look at that now. Now, all versions get the brand's softly supportive, progressive hydraulic cushion suspension and much else too. Although, as usual, you have to avoid base trim to get the real niceties. Uh, that base trim level, as I mentioned earlier, is feel spec. And to be fair, as also referenced earlier, that includes a reasonable amount by class standards. Even at this level of the range, C5 Aircross buyers can expect 17-inch Eclipse alloy wheels, LED daytime running lights, auto headlamps and wipers, an acoustic windscreen, um, heated mirrors, roof rails, uh, 3D rear lights, magic wash, integrated windscreen wipers, an alarm and rear parking sensors. You also get a space saver spare wheel too. Move inside and you'll find dual zone climate control, a 12.3 inch TFT digital instrument binnacle display, a lumbar adjustment for the driver's seat, a leather effect dashboard fascia and a two position boot floor. Uh, the 8 inch centre dash capacitive touchscreen includes a six speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth and a mirror screen media connectivity function. Now this allows you to duplicate uh, your phone handsets display onto the centre dash monitor and the setup support the mirror link system for Android devices and Apple CarPlay for iPhones. Most C5 Aircross buyers in this country, though, will find the £2,100 premium that Citroen asks to trade up to the mid-range flare spec that we have here. Uh, models of this grade are recognisable by larger 18-inch swirl alloy wheels, rear privacy glass and chrome effect exhaust trim. Uh, there are some key extra interior features at this level too. Amongst them, the more supportive advanced comfort seats and the Citroen Connect nav sat nav system that comes with Tom Tom live traffic updates and voice recognition. Uh, plus there are useful features like front parking sensors, a uh, 180 degree Vizio Park colour reversing camera, an electrochrome rear view mirror, uh, a two-tone horn and follow me home lighting that at night guides you to your front door. The cabin gets a classy upgrade too. The Metropolitan Grey Ambiance package that you get at this level gives you upholstery trimmed and a mixture of grey grained leather and graphite cloth. At flare level, you also get as standard what is probably this C5 Aircross model's most unexpected feature, the connected cam, the world's first built-in dash cam system. Now with this, you get an integrated camera with a 128 gigabyte memory, which is positioned in front of the rear view mirror housing and gives the uh, lens a 120 degree view of what's out of the car. Now you can use this to take fun pictures or videos that via a dedicated app can be stored or uploaded to social media 
media sites, plus the camera also acts as a dash cam that would automatically save video footage 30 seconds before and one minute after a collision. Now this can be used as evidence to your insurer that you weren't at fault and it uses GPS satellite tracking to pinpoint the location and time of any event. If you want even more, top spec Flare Plus trim provides that. Uh, the look at this level is subtly different thanks to even larger 19 inch art bitone diamond cut wheels and a gloss black finish for the upper radiator grille and the rear bumper fascia. There are auto dipping intelligent beam headlights, acoustic laminated front windows, uh, keyless entry and a powered tailgate that can be operated by gesture control. Inside there's a huge opening panoramic glass roof, a wireless smartphone charging plate and aluminium trim for the pedals. Quite a lot of kit then, but there's still space on the spec sheet for lots of extras. Now we'd argue that a key option box to tick is that for the grip control traction control system, uh, which unfortunately can only be had for £800 more on the automatic transmission models. Uh, now this package measures out traction for the front wheels in slippery conditions in a way that's tailored to different kinds of terrain. Plus, it includes grippier tyres and hill assist descent control. Uh, now, while it may not be really necessary for most of us to have fully fledged four-wheel drive on a crossover of this kind, neither do most of us want to pay the premium for an SUV and then be left slithering around like everyone else when the weather turns icy. Now, that's where grip control comes in. That apart, probably the first thing that you're going to want to do is to get the look of this car right. Now bear in mind that unless you want your C5 Aircross finished in flat polar white, you're going to have to pay your dealer extra for one of the optional metallic paint colours. Uh, we've got Volcano Red here. Having decided that, you're going to need to fix on the colour-coded finishing that you want for the front corner intakes, the roof rail trimming and the side sill air bump panels. Uh, you can have all these areas painted silver at no extra charge, courtesy of the silver anodized colour pack, which comes as standard across the range. Or you can have those features painted in red or as here in white, although those two finishes will cost extra with the base feel spec. Now, staying with aesthetics, flare buyers are offered a black exterior pack that'll dress the car up with a contrast colour perda near a black roof and meaner looking 19 inch art black painted rims. Uh, those wheels are also available as an option if you've decided on top flare plus trim. And with both the flare C5 aircross variants, you can swap out the metropolitan grey ambiance interior trimming package for a classier but very expensive hype brown ambiance package, which features which is brown Napa leather upholstery. Um, now, if you've gone for a mid-range flare trimmed frame like this one, uh, you may well want to pay more for the panoramic glass roof that we have here. And you're quite probably going to want the hands-free tailgate we've got here too. Uh, most would order that uh, powered hatch as part of the optional techno pack that you can have with this mid-range variant. That also includes keyless entry and a wireless charger plate. Now, unfortunately, the squashy, supportive, advanced comfort seats can't be had even as an option with base field trim. But on that entry-level model, the clever connected cam dash cam can be for £200 more. I mean, come on, it's not much more than you'd pay for a cheap old aftermarket setup of this kind at Halfords. Um, on the two flare variants, you can, at extra cost, upgrade that dash cam setup with a speed cam Danger Zone subscription too. Uh, base field spec models can also be had with an optional city camera pack, which includes uh, front parking sensors and a reversing camera. On all models, you can also add in a load net for the boot and, of course, uh, the usual tow bar, roof cross rail and roof box options. Other practical extras include a protective cover, a multimedia docking kit that allows you to clip tablets onto the backs of the front head restraints, and an isotherm module, basically a carry box that keeps food and drink fresh, which can be clipped into one of the back seats. On to safety. Now, as you'd expect, there are all the usual things, twin front side and curtain airbags, ice fix child seat fastenings, and the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction, and stability control. 
plus there's driver attention assist. Now that's a timed system that will warn you if the electronics sense that your reactions uh, are getting drowsy at the wheel. Uh, in addition, uh, you'll want to know about the cutting edge electronic radar driven stuff and there's plenty of that. Uh, all versions of this Citroen get autonomous braking, uh, an active safety brake system which detects hazards ahead and which will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. Incorporated into that setup is forward collision warning which alerts you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. Uh, there is also a lane departure warning system which will alert you if you drift out of your lane on the highway. Um, if you avoid base trim that feature will be upgraded to active lane departure warning system status uh, which means that when you veer over the lane delineating lines subtle steering pressure will automatically be applied to ease you back to where you ought to be. That is just the start though. All versions of this C5 Aircross also come with coffee break alert, which after two hours of driving at over 40 miles an hour, alerts you to take a restorative break. And there's speed limit recognition, which pitches speed signs as you pass them and displays them on the dash. More important still is the standard Citroen Connect Box emergency and assistance system. That's a package which will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags go off. If you want more in terms of safety stuff, then you'll need to be looking at a top Flare Plus spec, uh, which has a further package of standard camera driven features. First up is adaptive cruise control with a stop and go function, which on an auto model uses a radar to automatically regulate your cruising distance to the vehicle in front at motorway speeds, even to the extent of stopping and then seamlessly starting off again if necessary. Uh, then there are intelligent beam headlights. Now they will automatically dip themselves for you at night. Um, there's driver attention alert too which constantly monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and also active blind spot monitoring. Now that will stop you from pulling out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. Now something else that Flare Plus buyers get as standard with automatic transmission is Citroen's Highway Driver Assist System, which is the closest the brand can currently get to any kind of autonomous driving setup. Now in highway driving, it automatically regulates your speed, your position on the road and your distance to the vehicle in front, although you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times and you also have to keep your wits about you because the car will quickly revert full control back to you when road markings become less than clear. We're used to modern Citroens being rather liked by class standards, particularly models that are like this one, built on the PSO Group's stiff, sophisticated EMP2 platform. So the news that the fastest and best equipped versions of this C5 Aircross tip the scales at well over 1.5 tonnes may prepare you for the fact that in trading up from the brand's smaller C3 Aircross model, which is a massive 400 kilos lighter, uh, your running cost returns are going to be very different. Of course, many C5 Aircross buyers won't be switching from something smaller in the crossover class, and those people will just be happy to see that this car's efficiency stats number amongst the better readings that you can expect to get from a mid-sized volume brand SUV of this kind. In evaluating them, we'll quote you figures based on readings calculated using the latest WLTP, that's World Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure Cycle, but the stats have been converted back to the most recent new European driving cycle, NEDC2 spec, since that's what a lot of rival models are still using. Um, we'll start with the returns possible from the base 1.2 litre PureTech 130 petrol power plant, since that's the one we're trying here. Um, this is supposed to be able to manage up to 44.2 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 119 grams per kilometer of co2 let's put that into perspective and tell you that a comparable uh, 1.5 liter petrol ford cougar can only manage up to 35.3 mpg and 160 grams per kilometer other rivals do get closer than that, but there aren't many that can beat Citroen showing here. And that's important if you're changing into a family SUV from a conventional family hatch and you want to reduce the efficiency downside of your switch. 
If that is the case, it's probably more likely that you'll be considering the other Volume 130 spec C5 aircross model, uh, the 1.5 litre Blue HDI variant, uh, provided that you're not put off by the fact that diesel engines are subject to a 4% company car tax surcharge. Uh, for a manual version of that derivative, the figures are up to 55.1 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 108 grams per kilometre of CO2. Uh, the 1.5 litre Blue HDI auto variant we'd recommend does even better. It manages up to 56.3 mpg and uh, up to 106 grams per kilometre of CO2. In this segment, only the 1.5 litre DCI versions of Nissan's Qashqai and Renault's Kajar can do better than that, and they don't deliver the kind of 300 newton metre pulling power that you get from this Citroen's 1.5 litre diesel engine. As for the other engine options, all only offered with automatic transmission, uh, well if budget allows you might want to try the 2 litre Blue HDI 180 diesel power plant. That returns up to 47.1 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 124 grams per kilometre. The alternative 180 HP unit in the 1.6 litre PureTech petrol automatic model manages 39.6 mpg and up to 129 grams per kilometre. Uh, that's in its conventional form. That 1.6 litre PureTech petrol engine uh, additionally features as part of the plug-in hybrid powertrain that Citroen's also developed for this car. And that mates that combustion unit with a 110 horsepower electric motor powered by a lithium-ion battery pack. What is fully charged that allows the car to travel up to 30 miles between charges and put out no more than around 50 grams per kilometer of CO2. The hybrid variant can then be recharged in less than two hours from a 6.6 kilowatt 32 amp wall box and it features an e-save function that allows the driver to reserve electrical energy for planned routes ahead, say for the town driving that you might have to do at the end of a long journey. You all have to do your bit in terms of efficiency too, of course, and that broadly means uh, driving with a bit of right foot restraint and remembering to press the provided eco button on the centre console whenever possible. Now that restricts throttle travel and the output of the air conditioner. Uh, there is a standard stop-start system, of course. Uh, the frequency of uh, you using that, uh, the trip computer records for some reason, and the diesel units run with the usual AdBlue additive, which you'll need to get topped up as part of regular servicing. Of course, running costs are about a lot more than just fuel economy and CO2 readings, so what else do you need to know? Well, service intervals for all engines are every 20,000 miles or once a year, whichever comes first. So you can budget ahead, the French maker offers its Citroen maintenance package and that lets you pay either a one-off fee or monthly instalments to cover the cost of the routine upkeep of your car for as long as three years or 35,000 miles. Every C5 Aircross comes with a three-year and 60,000 mile warranty. The first two years of that aren't subject to any mileage limits, but the third year, which is taken care of by your local dealer, is limited to 60,000 miles. Uh, there is also Europe-wide breakdown assistance included from new for the first year that you own the car. Looking at the longer term, you'll also have a 12-year guarantee against rust and 36 months cover for any paintwork defects, although that doesn't include stone chips and other wear and tear damage. Residual values are also going to be key to whole life running costs. Industry experts cap reckon a predicted figure for this car of up to 49% after a typical three year 30,000 mile period. And that's the same as you get from a comparable Peugeot 3008. Only Kia Sportage betters that amongst the volume brands in this segment. Uh, go for something like a Nissan Qashqai, a Ford Cougar or a Renault Kajar and you'd be looking at uh, getting 6 to 7% less than that for your car at the end of your ownership period. What else? Uh, insurance. Well, let's finish by guiding you through the groupings. The 1.2 litre PureTech petrol model sits in group 16E to 17E, depending on the trim variant you choose. Uh, for the 1.6 litre petrol PureTech variant, it'll be group 24E. As for the 1.5 litre Blue HDI diesel, well, the main feel and flare spec models attract a grouping of 17E, but with the Flare Plus uh, that gives you all the extra camera-driven safety tech, that rises to 18E, which makes no sense to us. If you'd prefer the larger 2 litre Blue HDI diesel with 180 horsepower, then your premium will be based on a Group 25E ranking.
We started off this review by pointing out that Citroen has no heritage in this segment. That's not quite true. Back in the 1920s, Andre Citroen was thinking a good deal about how the motor car could be engineered for life beyond the beaten track. A version of his model of that day, the B2, was duly produced with a clever half-track system that the Parisian entrepreneur was proud enough of to want to put to the ultimate test. Two brave explorers, Georges-Marie Hart and Louis Audouin Dubreuil, were tasked with undertaking the very first crossing of the Sahara Desert with a fleet of eight B2 half-track models. And they duly did on the 20th of June 1925, having covered 1,865 miles of Saharan Desert to Timbuktu and back. It created an adventure legend and opened up a route from the Mediterranean into North Africa. Add clever engineering, you see, to an apparently ordinary motor car and you might get it to do extraordinary things. Uh, that was certainly our hope here. The progressive hydraulic cushion suspension of a C5 Aircross isn't going to be much use to it in the Saharan Desert, but it'll help it immensely in the much more challenging environment that this car will actually spend its life in. Yours, a school-run world of speed humps, potholes, tarmac tears and long taxing days that require your automobile to look after you on the drive home. The damping isn't quite as magic carpet-like as this distinctively French maker likes to think it is. Uh, to truly get that, you'd need something like the tricky hydropneumatic suspension system used by the classic models of the 60s and 70s that Citroen is now so keen to remind us about. But those were also the cars that led the company to bankruptcy and a takeover by Automobile Peugeot, from which the identity of the brand has taken decades to recover but recover it has. Citroëns are different and a bit special once again. Uh, they're not quite as individualistic as they once were. A profitable volume brand can no longer make cars of that sort, but most of the models in the company's current lineup do at least try to bring something a little unique to their respective segments, as this one needs to do, given its late arrival in the crossover class. This car's emphasis on comfort won't endear it to magazine road testers or people who, well, rather mystifyingly, want their family SUV to handle with sporting sharpness. And there are cheaper cars in the cash car class and there are contenders that might tempt you with classier cabins or with an extra row of seats. But if you can look beyond all that, there's much here to like aside from the cosseting ride, the spacious interior, the versatile back seat arrangement and the neat equipment touches like the connected cam dash camera. In summary, it's refreshing to see this Gallic brand getting back to what it does best. We think that this car stands out as a result. You might too.